Tech is the future. It ain't going nowhere. Morning, guys, or good afternoon. Hope everyone's having a good day. And today I'm here with Tech G. How you doing, man? What's going on, man? How you doing? Good, good. I just I'm uh, I'm I'm anxious. I'm excited about this one. It should be fun. Usually, what I do is when I when I interview anyone or just bring someone to my channel, I I like to do like an introduction. So can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? and what you do, and just a little bit about yourself. I'm Tech G. Gil is actually my first name, but I go by Tech G. I've done a lot, so I don't know exactly where you want me to start, but um, what I currently do, I currently do like IT research for a company, primarily uh, it deals with uh, researching IT type products. Basically to uh, kind of compare and contrast IT applications to make sure a company isn't wasting their money or if they don't have similar products where they can divest or in or reinvest or whatever the case may be. Also in conjunction with that, I also teach IT at a tech college. So, um, so I do that. Um, as you can see, I'm an Army vet. So I served 13 years active duty in the United States Army. And I did IT when I was in the military. That was my primary job. And I've done everything from, you know, basic help desk roles when I first got started out, sysadmin stuff, net admin stuff, help desk manager, supervisor, however you want to phrase it, or service desk supervisor, I should say. Um, I used to work with the NSA at one point, deployed twice. I got three college degrees. I went to Tuskegee University from 1998, 2002, where I majored in aerospace engineering. I never did anything with that degree. I got a master's in IT and also got an MBA. And I'm married with two kids. So that's pretty much my life in a nutshell for the most part. Though. That's awesome, man. Thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Appreciate that. So I wanted to ask you a couple more questions. So what what is um like what made you get into IT? What was like the the prime thing or the prime reason why you like you're like you know what IT is for me or this is for me? Like what got you into IT? Well, going back to my college days, uh, I think in 1999 when I was a sophomore at college, I actually took a computer science class. Um, I think it was C plus plus at the time, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know why I signed up to take that class, but I went in there and took the class and I failed it. I was in there paying attention to all the girls. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't really like super focused. So I ended up failing that class. Anyways, uh, time moves forward. 2002, I, I don't, all the way up to 2002, I don't do anything related to tech. And then, you know, like 22 years old, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. So I decided to go join the army and I was going to go into the infantry so I could try to be all I can be. You know, just, you know, become a real life G.I. Joe because this is like right after 9-11. Well, my uncle, he was in the Army at the time and he convinced me to go into a career field, the signal career field, basically uh, dealing with electronics, and electronic communications and all that stuff. And I uh, basically pick a job that would uh, provide opportunities for me after the military. So I went in there, I took the ASFAB, it's, it's the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. It's basically like a little test to give all high school students or people who are trying to enter the military and basically Basically, the higher you score on the test, the more options to pick from career fields you can uh, select from. So I think I ended up scoring like a 90. And I think the highest you can get like a 99 or something like that. And um, I didn't even study. I just went there and took the test. Anyways, that presented all types of opportunities. And so I initially picked this MOS, uh, Military Occupational Specialty, called 25 Papa. Basically, it dealt with microwave systems. Not the kind that heat up your food, but you're dealing with like tropo signals, line of sight signals. It's somewhat directly related to dealing with uh, satellite communications in a sense. But anyways, after about two years of doing that, I got a chance. I got opportunity to do what's called a reclass where you get to change a job so i end up going into what they call 25 bravo and that is the actual it mos of the army and so i got into that i just kind of rode that out all the way till i got out the army but the main reason why i actually picked it is because um like i say when i was 22 i didn't i didn't i didn't know exactly what i wanted to do after college mm -hmm. but i just had this thing in the back of my head with my uncle telling me you need to think about life after the military because my uncle at the time he was on the verge of retiring from the military and starting his second chapter in life i was at the very beginning of mines with the military so shout out to my uncle <laughs> he's the one that uh convinced me to go into it i was going to ask you um going back into how, how you got started in IT. Um, from my understanding, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I guess there's a lot of like free resources. Is that is that true? Like when you're in the military, uh, there's like free certifications, like free training that you could take advantage of? Or is that, am I making that up? Or is that something that um, does exist? Well, it's a yes and no. Um, so 
what do I mean? So when I was in the army, if I wanted to get my A plus, net plus, security plus, or maybe even CCNA, or maybe even something higher, if there was like a need for it, then I can convince my chain of command to pay for it. The chain of command, they, they would uh, pay for the vouchers. One thing I used to do when I was in the army, I was what they call an AIT instructor. That stands for advanced individual training. Basically, this is the place you go to after basic training. So you go to basic training, you learn how to shoot weapons, throw grenades, and basic life-saving techniques. Basically, you learn how to be an infantry man. Then you go to this place called AIT, and this is where you actually learn how to do the job that you signed up for in the military. I was one of the teachers there for like four, four and a half years or something like that. We would train people on how to get started into in IT, A+, plus, Net+, plus, Security+, plus, and some other stuff. And uh, we would give them vouchers to go take the test, so they didn't have to come out of pocket to pay for any of these other vouchers. There are some other MOSs, like there's another one called 25 Delta that deals with uh, cybersecurity. Anyways, you got to meet certain qualifications to actually get into that. Basically, if you got selected to go into that MOS field, they would send you to all these, these cybersecurity related classes and the military will pay for all your certifications. So I'm saying, yes, the military will pay for a lot of your certs, especially if there is a direct relevance for it as it relates to your job. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the possibility they might not pay for your certs because if you decide to go get some totally random cert out of the blue that kind of doesn't necessarily have to deal with what your job is in the military, you may or may not get them the the military to pay for the cert or you may you know you may have to do some uh come up with a very convincing story but for the most part based off of what i've seen they will pay for your most of your certifications and Got some it. of these certs as you know they can go from hundreds possibly into the thousands of dollars interesting i was going to ask you another another question um for people and just in general because people always ask me this how important in it is people skills people skills are very important i believe so and it's not just IT, it's, it's it's in life in general. I say it like this because, like I said, I taught entry-level IT when I was in the military for, four, for about four and a half years. And then part of what I do now is teach at a tech college where I teach young young adults or people who are transitioning, people my age and older. And there's a common theme amongst a lot of people. Obviously, this is applicable to everybody, but a lot of tech people from what I've seen over the years, they're very good at click clacking on computers, trying to solve problems and all that wonderful stuff that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. But there's this other side where a lot of them, they lack in the people skills department where they don't really know how to talk to people. When I say talk to people, I'm not, I'm not talking about talking to other tech savvy people you know, where y'all are speaking to each other in acronyms and <laughs> all day long, you know, kind of like I used to do in the military. But basically, if you got like a customer coming up to you, they're asking you about a computer problem, you know how to relate to this person on their level while still conveying the necessary information to them that needs to be conveyed so that they can solve their problem instead of you trying to talk to them at a techie level and mm -hmm. they're just looking at you with their eyes glazed over. So this, this is an important skill set that I think a lot of people need to develop and oftentimes it just requires you learning how to talk and come out of your little shell and you know just talk to people because some of these IT courses, especially matter of fact, with the A plus cert, there's actually a section on that where they put that in the actual material about how to relate and talk to people because apparently this is a uh, can be somewhat problematic. I'm not saying it necessarily is a bad thing, but you just have to understand the mentality of a lot of people that go into tech. They just want to go inside the little broom closet, cut the lights off, get the click clacking away, and they don't want to be bothered by anybody. And that's totally understandable. But but depending upon what you do, you may have to interact with other people that are not in tech and you have to hopefully, hopefully you come across sounding like a, a human being instead of a, a robot <laughs> so, <laughs> so that people can like you. And plus, mm -hmm. the people skills, they can help you get a job. When you go sit down for an interview, yes, it's good that you know all this IT stuff, but at the same time, the interviewer is making judgments about you based off of just your basic general demeanor as a person. Are you likable? People skills is very important. I always ask that question because I work with executives and I work with C-level folks and I and I talk about people skills. I talked about like, I feel like you could teach anyone IT, but it's kind of hard for you to teach people skills. Like either, either have it or don't have it or you learn it over time. So that's why mm -hmm. I, I like to ask that to everyone because I just want to hear your personal opinion on it because when you go to a job interview, it's an interview, right? You have with the company and then you want to see if they feel well with you and if you feel well with them and it's like a person not only thing, right? Do you feel well with the company culture? I can give you an example of what I'm talking about with the job interview thing. As a matter of fact, it actually directly relates to uh, one of my jobs uh, working at a tech college. So I had a different job at the time. I was looking to transition to another job and I seen them advertising to go teach tech. And I'm like, I read through the job description. I, I meet all the requirements, all the educational certification experience. I met all that stuff. Anyways, they initially called me in for an interview and I forgot all about it. Never even showed up. I just didn't think twice. About a week or two later, they called me again, was like, do I want to come in for the interview? I was like, well, damn. 
I kind of blew off the first one, you know, not on purpose. So anyways, I go into the interview. I'm thinking, well, I'm probably not going to get this job because I didn't show up for the first one. So I go into the interview and I'm not even going to lie. They start asking me questions. I start cracking jokes the entire interview. I'm like cracking jokes at my, the person interviewing me, like mocking, not being disrespectful. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a comedian or anything, but you know, they were asking little questions like my interviewer and I would just give them a response that was like a nonchalant type of response and mm -hmm. they would start laughing and giggling. And I was like, oh, okay. So I see where this is going. So I kept making jokes. So I left the interview. I was like, well, that, I'm not going to get the job. Before I even got back to my other office, they called me and was like, when can I start? I was like, what the hell? What happened was my personality was what they liked. They already saw I met the qualifications based on my resume. They just want, they basically just called me in there just to see if I was a likable person. Mm -hmm. And so I went in there, I guess I fit the personality traits of what they were looking for. Cause you know, you're dealing with teaching people. It's almost like with the, with the whole learning thing, I can go in there and spit numbers out all day long. I can uh, put you to sleep with slideshows all day long, but how effective is that if you don't actually like my personality? So, you know, that's just an example of people skills dominating over technical skills, at least in my personal scenario. I definitely agree with you. It just happens like sometimes you, they want to know if you fit well with the company because they don't want to hire someone who has like a, a nasty personality and like, why should we hire you? If, if your personality is horrible, you're going to be a headache to everyone in the company. So we want someone that has those people skills, you know, it's just, we could train you in IT. Like yeah. it's, 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 it's trainable. Anyone can learn it. You know, it's just, it's just everyone has their own way of learning. Right. Yeah. And um, I was gonna ask you another question. This is a random. This is another random question because, as you know, um, I do I do train students myself, and I do training myself. Mm -hmm. So, what got you into training people? What's your David Goggins motivation to to train people and 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 uh, and just training students and people? So, like I said, I, I taught IT when I was when I was in the army. Like I said, I did it for four and a half years, where I actually had to be in front of people six hours a day, seven hours a day, teaching them, making them laugh, trying to keep them engaged in the in the learning process. I developed a, a somewhat of a love for teaching, something that I never thought I would have developed ever in my life. I was like, there's no way in the world I would ever teach in any capacity. But then when the army forced me to do it, and I was over there kicking and screaming the entire time, I don't want to do it. And I actually got up there and did it. I was like, oh, this ain't that bad. And I was like, oh man, I'm actually pretty good at this. And I just kept going and going. I was like, and I became known as one of the go to teachers around the way for teaching, you know, a certain type of way. I developed this love for IT, right? Uh, teaching IT. So anyways, get out the army. I used to have a bunch of people asking me about IT, how to get started. And then I would always be like, go watch this video. Go sign up for this class. Go look at this person's stuff. They'll get you right. Not knowing if they ever did it or not. I Sometimes I didn't even really go in and vet the person to see if the person had a likable personality as to whether or not they would be able to relate. After I did that for a while and then ended up getting that job teaching at a tech college, all of a sudden then the pandemic hit. But And I was like, well, how do I teach? I'm not physically face to face like I normally am. And then, you know, students, they got all kinds of reasons as to why they can't get online or whatever. I just started making slideshows and recording videos and then uploading them to YouTube just for students to watch. That was like the only reason why I started doing it initially so mm -hmm. that they can watch the presentation and then you know, however we conducted class virtually, we could talk about whatever we want to talk about. That's how I got started, man. It was really a bunch of people asking me and then the kickoff of the pandemic and everybody working at home, prompting me to actually building out actual courses and going through the motions of that so that do my part to get people educated and spun up starting tech. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Yeah, it does answer my question. I was going to ask you another question. How do you, not you, but how do you stop a student from procrastinating and, and not being motivated to learn the stuff you're teaching them? What's your way of doing it? You really can't. That comes down to uh, self-motivation. So I can get up here with all the bells and whistles, start tap dancing and swinging from the ceiling rafters, to doing backflips, trying to convince you every which way that you need to learn this because this is going to benefit you. And we can hop into a time machine and fast forward five years from now. And I can be like, if you do what I tell you to do, this is what your salary is going to be looking like. But we come back to the present. I can't make you want to do it. There has to be something in you. So it doesn't matter how it's all packaged up, who's giving you the presentation. At some point, it comes down to you as the individual. You're going to have to take time and learn the material because you're the one that has to go in there and pass the certification exam. I can't take the test for you. We can do everything we can in our power to convince you to want to learn. At some point, you have to actually step up and allow for the learning to commence. What is it all saying? I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make him drink. Yes, I think that's yes. applicable in this scenario as well when it comes to learning tech. I was going to ask you, like, uh, let's go back a little bit. So I guess what are some of the things you recommend someone that's brand new to IT for resources? Like I always talk about, I know you teach this. I teach this too. I always talk about the CompTIA A+. And I get so much hate for it. <laughs> <laughs> 
What are your thoughts on that for someone brand new to IT? So first thing I always say is you got to decide what is it that you want to do in tech. You got to think about it. IT. So basically, just imagine that there's this umbrella. An umbrella is called information systems, IS. Under the information systems umbrella is IT, which deals with information technology because an information system, that's basically anything that's capable of recording information. So you could take a, a pencil and a piece of paper and technically that's an information system. But when we get into the portion that branches off into IT, now we're dealing with specific technologies that deal with information systems. Under the IT umbrella, you have various different different lanes of IT. And so how I like to equate this is think of the medical field. You got dentists, baby doctors, brain surgeons, psychologists, you know, just all types of different stuff. You need to figure out which lane in IT you want to go down. And that's going to ultimately dictate where you should probably start. So if you come up to me, you'd be like, hey, I want to be a computer engineer, computer scientist. I want to actually design the RAM. I want to actually design, you know, the components on the motherboard. Well, I'm probably going to tell you, you have to go to college and learn, take some engineering classes, get brushed up on your calculus, your derivative equations, hire you some tutors to help you make this thing happen. If you like, hey, I want to learn cybersecurity, I'd be like, well, the easiest path, in my opinion, is probably just go start with A plus, net plus, security plus. Or if you don't know anything about computers, start with IT fundamentals. If you want to do um, database development, it's probably best that you, you don't, you don't necessarily have to need learn IT I mean, not IT, but A plus for database development. You just need to go learn MySQL or, you know, some type of database development program. You want to uh, venture off into cloud computing technologies. You may or may not need to know A plus. You might be able to just jump straight into getting an Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure search. So it just depends on what your goal is. And once we can define, define what your goal is, I can kind of help pinpoint you in the right direction to get started. But uh, most people that I interact with, they have no idea what they want to do in IT. That's perfectly fine. If you don't know what you want to do in IT, I tell people, all right, well, let's go figure out if you need to learn IT fundamentals, meaning do you even know where the power button is on a computer? If you don't know that, let's start here. If you do, all right, let's, let's go ahead and figure out A+, plus, Net+, plus, Security+, plus. and then from there, you can kind of figure out what direction in life you may want to go with your career. I love your answer because you have, you basically answered all my questions packaged into one with, I was going to ask you other questions and then you just came out of nowhere and answered all my other questions. So thank you for answering those questions. Um, but, um, yeah, you're spitting out facts. That's the one thing I talk about IT too myself is that, you know, if you, if you're brand new and you know absolutely nothing about IT, you, you may want to look at, uh, just fundamental IT, right? Like just look at the fundamental certifications and get started with that. And I always jump back to uh CompTIA A+ plus because I feel like everyone should learn fundamentals especially when you're brand new especially when you're training someone and they're yeah. brand new and they don't they want to do like I'm pretty sure you have students like this right like oh I want to do uh Akali Linux or yeah. I want to do hack the box or I want to do try hack me or I want to get into into pen testing or or yeah. cybersecurity and then uh when you ask them about the Windows 10 operating system they know absolutely nothing <laughs> about it and then they 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 don't know fundamentals yeah and then you like, I need you to stop, stop. I need you to stop getting in a rush, being in a rush and stop trying to go too advanced and just take a step back a little bit, take a breather and just, yeah. you know, look at the fundamentals. No. And that's important because what I've discovered as to why people say that, like I say, where I, where I work at and also what I do on my channel, people always jump. I want to be a cybersecurity expert. I want to do some penetration testing, red hat, black hat. I want to be, be a part of anonymous. You know, they're on some, some crazy stuff like that. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And the reason why is because of marketing, how a lot of people sell the concept of IT. It's all about the marketing. The term cybersecurity is a buzzword. It's a very hot term. You can go turn on the news every other day. You hear about people hacking into companies. They're infecting systems with malware and you watch the news. Cybersecurity, cybersecurity. And the president, uh, President Biden, he, he's dumping a bunch of money into cybersecurity programs. So basically people see this term cybersecurity and they're like, wow, cybersecurity. I want to I want to be one of the cool people defending computer systems. And that's, that's totally fine. The problem is nobody talks about the elementary stuff. And so I guess another way to equate this when i was going to school in college 
I, like I said, I was an aerospace engineering student. I was thinking I want to work for NASA. I want to design airplanes and rockets. I want to do all this cool stuff because where I, li I live in Orlando. So when they blast the rockets off, I can literally go outside my house and see them going up in the sky. But here's the problem. Nobody told me about calculus. Nobody told me about derivative equations and statics and all these classes I had to take that required me to go in there and pretty much question everything I thought I knew about math in my entire life. So in order so that I can have the official title of declaring I'm an engineer, I work for NASA, I do this, I do that. So I see that kind of happening now with cybersecurity. It's cybersecurity, cybersecurity. Just, just imagine cybersecurity is in these bright neon lights and everybody's like, ooh, I want to do that. It sounds cool. But nobody tells you, do you even know what a computer is? Do you even know what binary is? I'm not saying that you necessarily need to know what binary is, but do we have an understanding of what cybersecurity is? Because at the end of the day, no matter what version of IT or, or realm of IT you go into, it's all about computers at the end of the day, a, a end device communicating with another device. And within that, it's all about ones and zeros, binary, pushing information across the wire. So I tell people, I don't necessarily care what you do. If you want to be a programmer, database developer, cybersecurity, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. I personally think you should learn about the core product that's associated, that is built around this entire industry of IT. It all starts with the computer. This is a smartphone, but this is a computer that has the capabilities to make a phone call that fits in the palm of my hand. Let's understand the basic components of a computer. This thing inputs information, process processes information, outputs information, and stores information. All computers, no matter how big or small, do that. Do you have to be a subject matter expert in every area? No, but I think it's important for people to understand just that base layer so that when they do decide to become a cloud practitioner or whatever, whatever, hopefully that kind of grounds them in some type of reality as to why they're doing what they're doing or why they're trying to pursue whatever, whatever it is that they're trying to pursue. Hope that makes okay. sense. No, I love, I love, I love your answer. And actually, someone asked a question, so I'm not sure if you could see the. So, Tech G, what are your thoughts on Network Plus exam? Is it worth a certification for someone who wants to be in cybersecurity network engineer? Yes, because I teach it. But <laughs> um, <laughs> so here's the thing. So a lot of people ask me about Network Plus versus getting a CCNA, because either one of those certs, especially the CCNA, can lead you in the direction of, of what did he say, a, a cybersecurity network engineer? Engineer. Yep. You know that in common combination with a security plus cert or some other penetration testing cert or something like that right network plus i believe it's important because you're learning how the how, how computers actually network and communicate with each other now compare that to the ccna they're pretty much almost the same test except network plus is a vendor neutral test meaning they'll tell you about a router and a switch but you're not really going to go beyond that mm -hmm. ccna they're going to tell you specifically about cisco routers Cisco switches, and you're going to learn some basic commands. Uh, well, not basic, but you're going to learn some commands on how to program them things up just for Cisco. You're not going to learn about Ju what is it, Juniper and Juniper. all the other stuff that they got going on. You're just going to learn mm -hmm. straight about Cisco. I believe it's worth it. I consider A plus, Net plus, and Security plus one of the three foundational certs that you should get because, like I say, A plus teaches you about the computer. Network plus teaches you how the computers communicate with the rest of the world, i.e., the internet or whoever you're trying to, you know, directly connect to. This Security Plus teaches you basic security concepts to protect your computer and to train your other workers in your environment to not be clicking on random links and emails. So I think it's worth it. Network Plus cannot hinder you or harm you on your path to becoming a cybersecurity network engineer. It can only help you because it'll give you that base layer understanding of how is it when I'm able to click on Amazon on my phone and go order something that I'm able to talk to the Amazon web server and then 12 hours later, there's a package sitting in front of my house. They kind of explain the process for how that happens. Mm -hmm. And I think that'll help you later on when you become a network engineer and you got to get really nitty gritty with it. At least you'll already understand your ABCs and one, two, three as opposed to just jumping straight into calculus. Oh, makes sense. I agree with you. Keep it tech easier. It's a salute to KevTech and Tech G. What's up, What's up, bro? What's up man? How you doing? Darren asked a question. Which career I don't have to spend a lot of extra hours after work? <laughs> um which career you could just you know stay at home and not do anything i mean listen it doesn't matter what you go into if you want to if you want to maximize your earning your income or become known as the best in whatever that whatever field it is that you work in it's probably going to require you to spend after hours time doing stuff 
like I say, I do research professionally and I teach professionally. But guess what? When I come home, I still got to put in work to make these slideshows and make these YouTube videos and try to convince people to subscribe to my channel and all that stuff. I still have to put in the work. It just doesn't stop. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. You have to you have to put in you have to put in the work if you want results. It's not it doesn't come to you. Unfortunately, it's not how it works. Yeah. I wish it worked that way, but it doesn't work that way. You have to put in the work. <laughs> I was gonna ask you, uh, what are some free resources you recommend right now? Be be besides your channels, I'm gonna go over your channel a little a little bit for learning CompTIA A plus, Network Plus, Security Plus for someone brand new. Well, Tech G, I know we're gonna talk about that later, but now there's all types of resources, <laughs> man. You can go to YouTube. I'm not the only person that teaches tech on on um, YouTube. There are other people out there, way bigger than me, way more popular than me. Google, Google's your friend. If you want to spend a little money, you can go to places like Udemy. They always got some type of sale going on over there. I don't think I've ever seen a Udemy class that's sold for more than ten dollars. Like they always have it listed as nine hundred dollars, and it's always scratched off and it's going for ten bucks. I, I I don't know what's going on with that, but. YouTube, Google, those are probably your best options for for seeking free resources. The public library, get you a library card. You can go in there. I'm pretty sure they got an IT section in there. You sit down, crack open those 500, the 900 page books and get the reading to your heart's content. Cheap alternatives, like I say, is Udemy and various other you know sites that are similar to that. That's basically it as far as the free stuff that I know is going out there and uh, potentially getting your scavenger hunt on, on YouTube and Google until you find somebody that is presenting the information that gives you the warm and fuzzies mm -hmm. that can convince, that can hopefully convince you that this information is thorough enough to uh, help you pass whatever you're trying to learn. Oh, that's, yeah, I agree with you. I was going to ask you another, another question. This is a random question for you. How important is networking? And I'm not talking about TCP IP, talking about like LinkedIn. How important is that? I think it's important. I haven't become like a subject matter expert in LinkedIn. <laughs> I mean, I got about 150 connections on there. I, I don't I don't really spend like a whole lot of time. But regardless of that, networking is important in life, period. It's just one of those basic life skills that could be transferable across many realms. Because like for me, I'm in two fraternities. I got like a fairly decent network of people I can reach out to that can help me if I need help or point me in the right direction. As a matter of fact, one's in the chat right now. Keep it techie. He's a part of my network. If I need to call him up, which I've called him up plenty of times on the phone, be like, hey, I need assistance with this. Do you know about this? Can you help me solve this? He's a part of my network that can either point me in the right direction or help me solve the problem. You're a part of my network now. Um, Master IT is in my network. Uh, basically, networking is just you as the individual can't do everything. You don't have all the answers in life. It's, it's impossible for you to be that way. So it is in your best interest to try to reach out to people by way of social media or LinkedIn, because you know LinkedIn is basically a professional version of social media for job hunting and making connections with people. It's probably in your best interest to try to find like-minded people that share similar interests to you that can hopefully help advance advance your career or point you in the right direction to get whatever answer you need to get answered. So this goes back to our original point of people skills or whatever. You got to be able to have people skills initially. And then once you build the people skills, you're not shy, you're not scared to talk to people. You can use that to learn how to begin to network with people. Because if you're shy and you just like to stand in the corner sucking on your thumb all day, networking is probably not going to work for you because you don't know how to open up and talk to people to, in a manner that's beneficial for both of you so that you can hopefully solve whatever issue that you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. hope that makes sense. No, no, those, those make sense. I agree with you. I was going to ask you another question. I know you made a, because I like to do my homework, right? Mm -hmm. I know you made a video on how to get free hardware equipment. So what's your like like laptops and desktops? Oh. I remember you made a video on that. I'm yeah. going back in. I'm going back in time. <laughs> don't, don't think I don't watch your videos. <laughs> I to watch your videos. So if someone if someone is um, brand new to IT, I'm just gonna ask you a general question. Someone's brand new to IT. This is this is the thing that bothers me the most. But how do you get job experience in IT when you have no job experience? So you know you have all these job requirements, right, for IT. Yeah. So what is your recommendation for that? So it's like, oh, uh, it's asking for job experience, but I don't have job experience and I can't get job experience because I can't get the job. You know, it's just like first thing you got to understand when you're getting started and you go to websites like Indeed and you're reading the job description, you got to understand that nine times out of 10, that job description is written by somebody in the HR department. That job description is probably something they Google from another job description and it outlines the perfect candidate. There is no such thing as the perfect candidate that knows everything in that job description. What I like to tell people is if you think you can do at least 50% of the stuff on that job description, apply for the job anyway, because the other 50% you'll learn. 
uh, they're, they're going to have to teach you. So they just want to make sure you, you meet at least a few bare requirements. But if you're one of these people like, well, I don't know nothing. I can't apply for anything, which is totally understandable. You also have to understand when you're looking for an entry level job, most of the people already know that you don't know anything. Matter of fact, I was uh, looking up on Indeed the other day in my area. I was showing some students that are having a hard time believing that they can get a job. I found this one particular job and I told the students I might go redo my resume and go apply for this job my damn self. Because it's, it's an entry level job that's offering to pay $80,000 a year. All you need is a high school diploma or a GED, A plus, network plus. And I was like, I was like, what kind of job is this? I might need to go apply for this and make it seem like I don't know anything about tech to go get this job. But what I'm saying is, even though they're offering that type of salary, I'm like, let's look at the what they're asking. They're asking for a person with a high school diploma in or GED, and they're only asking you to have A plus and Network Plus. Do you really think that even though they may have all these other bullet points listed in the job posting, do you really think that they're honestly expecting somebody to come in here and know all of this stuff? No, they're not. They know that you don't have the experience. Nine times out of ten, they're probably just they they probably just want you just to have your A plus and Network Plus certification and or your high school diploma. And once you get in there, they're probably just going to interview you just to see if they like you, and then they'll make a decision based off of that. So. If you don't have experience and you're just getting started, don't look at it as, oh man, nobody's gonna nobody's gonna take me. You have to learn how to understand what's going on here. We all know that you don't have experience as a brand new person coming into IT and you're just getting your career started. Everybody knows this. They just wanna see if you understand the basic of the basics and those certifications can help prove that. Now, how can you get experience as a brand new person? There's a thousand million ways. One of the ways I tell people, if you go to church, if you're religious or whatever, or you go to a community center or something, ask the pastor or whoever runs that community center, you know, especially if they're not on any type of contract with anybody, ask them if you can go in there and uh, tinker with their IT systems to make upgrades to it. Like, mm -hmm. let's just say your, your pastor or your church or whatever, all of a sudden, all the congregation members, they don't want to go to church because of the pandemic, the whole uh, social distancing thing. You could have went up in there, be like, hey, pastor, I know your congregation's at home. Can I come in here and make some recommendations so that we can live stream your services? to all your members at home and so they can still get the good word as if they're actually physically in here. And if the mm -hmm. pastor was like, yeah, then all of a sudden he cuts you a little check. All right, here's $500. Go get the necessary stuff. You build it up. Now, all of a sudden you got your live stream going on. You've reached out. You helped most of your congregation, educated them how to, how to tune into the live stream. Man, you could throw all of that on your resume as something that you've done. You're the go-to guy in your family for fixing grandma's internet every time her internet goes out. You can throw that on your resume. You go out there, you download a program called Packet Tracer or whatever the other version is, I can't remember what it's called. And you learn how to program routers and switches and build these little virtual networks. That's all the experience you can put on your radio. So basically what I'm saying is, there's a lot of stuff that you can do that you don't think is experience that can technically be qualified as experience. iPhones. Let's just say I drop my iPhone, I crack it or something like that, and I bring it to you. You dissect my iPhone and fix it and bring it back to life. That is experience because this is a computer. Remember, I told you this is a computer that has the capabilities of making phone calls. So if you were to fix my iPhone, matter of fact, the iFixit stores that people take their phones to, what do you think they're in there doing? That is something that you can use. So there's a lot of different things you can do in your everyday life that you may not readily recognize, but if it has to deal with a computer, you fixing it, breaking it down, solving the problem, you can put it on your resume. Now, I would, I would caution this. I would say you need to learn creative resume writing skills to make it seem like it's something more than what it actually is so that people can be like, oh, okay, you really are the man. So here's an example of what I mean. If I put on my resume, I successfully changed 20 illumination systems. What does that sound like I'm doing, y'all? I mean, it just, it just sounds weird to me, you know? <laughs> I successfully changed 20 illumination systems. That's the fancy way of me saying I successfully changed 20 light bulbs. Which <laughs> one sounds better? Changing 20 light bulbs or changing 20 illumination systems? Which one sounds more fancy and mm -hmm. has the wow factor? The illumination system, right? Mm -hmm. Even though all I did was change a light bulb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's ways you can do that, even if you don't have experience. And you're like, well, all I did was, all I did was just, uh, you know, change the RAM out. Well, let's let's figure out a creative way to reword that. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm just being honest with you. And no, I no, I'm not agree with you. This is stuff I learned in the army, ladies and gentlemen, because I used to have to write evaluation reports for people, and my bosses would always kick them back. We need to reword this to make it sound like it was something that more than what it was. And so I got years of experience of doing this. So that might be a service I offer to y'all in the future. I don't know. Yeah, no, no, that's that's a good that's a good way of looking at it because people would put like, oh yeah, just change memory and like ah, uh, you know, just mm, it just sounds like uh, you know, it doesn't sound good. Do you do resume reviews and resume writing? I know how to write resumes. Now I don't have a business writing resumes, but I think I'm pretty good at writing resumes because, like I say, when I was in the army, I used to have to write what they call NCOERs, or I have to, used to have to write my own NCOERs because my boss mm -hmm. didn't want to do it for me, so I had to write my own stuff. Or I used to have to write awards to put people in for awards. You have to justify why they deserve an award, and there were a lot of times I had to write my own justification for my own award, even though somebody was supposed to be doing it. But mm -hmm. one of the main things was when the NCOER, the higher up it goes, all the way to your first sergeant or whoever, they would always mark it in red and they're like, "Go back and reword this. Go back and reword this." So I took that skill set of constant rewording stuff to make it seem like to make it sound better than what it actually was and apply that to resume writing skills so I've written quite a few resumes. I've helped other people. I helped my wife. I've helped other people, various other people tweak resumes here and there. Mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine recently up in Seattle. I tweaked his resume to help him get hired working with the 911 dispatcher people, whatever he does. And whatever changes I did to his resume sealed the deal for him to get hired on that job. So I don't offer it as a skill per se, uh, not a skill, but a, but a service right now. But I'm actually thinking about incorporating that into my overall business model that I, you know, the, the next iteration of my business model, I should say, that I, I'm hoping to launch in uh, 2022. I'm asking because someone was asking about it for you. Yeah. Uh, I said, do you have resources for resume writing? If you do, where are those places? That was his question. Google. I'm a huge fan of Google. Google and me are, you know, we're best friends out in these streets. I always go to Google. I haven't put together my own list. Say, go here, go here. I haven't done that. Someone asked a question about uh, Facebook. What are your thoughts on the metaverse and big data? I think they're going to be intricately linked together because I don't know how it's possible to for the metaverse to exist in the way that Mark Zuckerberg and friends wanted to exist without big data being directly tied to it because the metaverse at the end of the day is going to be a bunch of big data. But I did a video talking about it. I think there are pros and cons. The main thing that I'm worried about as far as how Mark Zuckerberg and everybody's trying to envision the metaverse is people becoming disconnected from reality. You know, we already spend way too much time on social media staring at our phones mm -hmm. to where, you know, people have, it's not like in the day when I, back in the nineties, when I was a teenager and I would go outside, play basketball, go to the mall, try to holler at girls and, you know, do what I'm supposed to do as a teenage boy. Everybody's communicating with each other through the phone. So you kind of, in my opinion, is you kind of lose these little, these little uh, nuances on how to, how to read human behavior, body language and all that stuff. And I don't know how well that's going to aid into it, but big data in the metaverse, I don't think you can separate them from each other. Because the metaverse is going to be big data. And someone asked a question that I think is for me or for you, but the thing is, this question is like kind of like hard for me to answer. Is what difference between help desk and technical support? And the reason why I say it's hard to answer because I don't look. Sometimes I don't look at job titles. My job titles annoy the living hell out of me because yeah. you may be titled something and you may not be doing everything that's in the title. I don't necessarily think there really is a difference. Well, I back that up. So help desk, technical support could be a myriad of different things that crosses various different levels. Help desk, technical support is involved. Okay, let me, I'm trying, let me hold on, let me think of it. Uh, technical support is an aspect of help desk, but help desk is not necessarily an aspect of technical support. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean is, like I was saying earlier, there are ver varying different degrees of technical support that may arise, but not all of that technical support is gonna start at the help desk. The help desk, initially, when you first interact with it, these are the people that you first come into contact with that are going to fix your tier one, tier two problems, like reset your password, create your user account, tell you to go unplug your network cable and plug it back in and restart your computer. You know, that's like, that solves like 99% of problems out there, right? That's what they're going to do. Technical support. What's it, what if I'm having issues with, um, I can't log into my server in the cloud or, you know, my, my server keeps getting knocked offline and blah, blah, blah. You may not necessarily call the help desk for that. You may have to you may you may call the help desk they may graduate you to two or three levels above the help desk to deal with a person that's specifically trained to fix this particular issue mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so yeah. yeah yeah technical support is an aspect of help desk but not all aspects of help desk are 
a part of technical support, if that makes sense. Yeah, and the other the other thing is that for someone who's watching today, the thing is is it's very important is that um, not every help desk job is created equal. So what do I mean by that? So basically, if you have a help desk job, you may be touching everything. You may not be touching everything. You may do you may be you may have more access than another person. And there, there's like help desk level one, tier one, tier yeah. two, tier three. You know, it's just like that's the other thing about job titles. Like sometimes they're very misleading. Like I had a friend yeah. that he got a help desk job, right? And all he did was password reset. That's all he had. <laughs> access to and he's called help desk like you know just the titles like look at the job description look at that and see see what they're asking for and see what your what your responsibilities are for that job because it's different everywhere is different so yep i agree uh someone says i wear all hats and self-employ the realities of real life are real different now with the <laughs> metaverse ai how they <laughs> ai there's a lot of uh hats people skills are more important more important than that than technology skills uh what else here we slightly more important People skills, like I said, Errol, I'm not going to give the whole speech again, but they can get doors open for you. They can get you access to people. But if it's in the realm of IT, you still need to know the tech stuff. Yep. That's that's when it, that's when it, that's what's going to keep the paychecks getting signed. And for, for you, in your opinion, how important is home labs? It depends on what it is you're trying to do. If you can afford to set up a home lab, then by all means, have at it. You know, go out there on eBay, Amazon, you buy your little switch and get the plug in and network cables and program it to your heart's content. If you can't, you need to look for a virtual lab simulator like uh, Packet Tracer or, you know, CompTIA. They have some stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, these are your hands on. Instead of you just doing, doing the book knowledge part, I'm going to look at the slideshows, read the books, answer the questions. That's cool. That's enough to get you to pass the test. But if you want to become proficient at it, you're going to have to get some type of practice on this stuff. So you got to get get some type of lab, whether it's virtually or you can physically afford the hardware to build a home lab. You all mm -hmm. means do what you got to do. And I'm going to share I'm going to show your, your channel. <laughs> oh, okay. Make sure y'all subscribe. Yeah. Tell us a little more about your channel. Tell us a little more. Like, I like to I like to dig into more information like an investigator, you know. Tell us more about your channel. The channel is just to teach entry-level IT. I got a class up there teaching IT fundamentals. I got the A+, 1001, 1002 class built out on there. I'm still putting together the Network Plus N10-007 class, which is still valid, even though the, 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 the latest iteration of the Network Plus exam just came out. But the 007 one, which is you know the, the past one, that doesn't expire to like summer of next year. And then I'll be putting up a Security Plus class. And I'm going to stop there. I'm not, I'm not building out any more free classes to put up. Like I say, I created the channel because it started during the pandemic. I actually started posting like March of last year. I needed a way to teach my classes even though I wasn't face to face with the students, I was like, well, let me just record videos, put it on YouTube. It wasn't necessarily started with the the goals of me becoming like a YouTube superstar and mm -hmm. becoming rich, even though that would be great, but whatever. <laughs> but it, was, it was really just it was really just designed. I need to figure out how to teach students. What can I do? Yeah, I can point them in the directions of other people, but I'm the teacher. Yeah. I'm the one doing the teaching here. So I need to create a lesson plan that could be accessible during this whole social distancing thing. And so that's why I started the channel. You know, and then it started growing obviously other people who aren't being taught by me directly started subscribing to the channel mm -hmm. if you click on the community tab there i post screenshots all the time of people who who will watch my content and let me know that they're passing the materials like i said i got people as young as age 15 to people older than me i'm 41 people older than me watching this stuff so it's become a help to people and it's just something that i do even though i don't have to do it i just do it and you know i earn a couple bucks off of it nothing life-changing but the biggest reward is helping people because there's a picture I posted a few months ago. This young brother, he was up um, working at 7-Eleven. I don't know what he does, but you could tell it was a 7-Eleven he was working at. While he's on shift at 7-Eleven, he's watching my videos, trying to learn whatever cert I was teaching so that he can hopefully get up out of working 7-Eleven or move into a, a role that pays more money. So mm -hmm. when I saw that, you know, it, it hit me right in the feels. I was like, oh, I'm doing something right. I had, a, I had one man tear fall out my eye. I was like, look at this. You know what I'm saying? I got people on shift at 7-Eleven watching me so that they can hopefully transition out of 7-Eleven. That was the whole point, man, just to provide entry-level IT. That's yeah, that picture right there. You see it? So to provide entry-level IT to people who've been asking me and the people that I've actually been teaching face-to-face, -face, that's why I put it up there. No, I like I, I like that. That's why I wanted to get you on my channel to talk because I, I appreciate what you do. You have to acknowledge like other people. Like it's not all about my videos too. Like I acknowledge small channels, big channels. I don't I don't I don't care how big your channel is. I just want to acknowledge people that are helping other people in the tech community. And I appreciate what you do. So that's why I, I wanted to bring you in today to talk. I wanted to ask you about your website. What's a, what's your website about? Well, it's just a place 
place. So technology G, that's just the main hub. So in the event that YouTube kicks me off of YouTube or something, all <laughs> everything is right there. Cause all the videos that I record, I've written this stuff out in case people want to get their read on. And then, you know, I just, I just basically, it's just the place where all the content on YouTube, this is just my home spot. And then on there, I also sell other stuff, virtual labs, study materials. And then like you scroll to the very top, you can see some of the stuff that I offer up there. And also this is going to be a spot where I eventually plan to um, add another addition to the business of teaching IT live over the internet, you know, for those who pay me. Because, you know, one thing you got to understand is I offer self-study methods. Meaning I put the material together for you. It's up to you to go watch the videos or read whatever and study whatever it is you got to study, right? Mm -hmm. But there's still a, a large number of people out there that prefer the teacher-student dynamic where they want to be taught in real time. So now I'm in the process of trying to develop that aspect of my business to where people log in to a portal. We're looking at y'all looking at me. I'm looking at you and I'm walking you step by step through teaching you what you need to know for A+. plus. In addition to that, I'm teaching you all types of different how to do various you know, different labs and things that I don't sell on my website so that you can get the real, you know, basically the stuff that I teach people in real life. I'm going to be teaching it over here. The, the real nitty gritty stuff to ensure mm -hmm. that you go out here and pass these tests on the first time, first try. So that's, that's something I'll, I'll be offering. But basically, my website is just it's just my home base for all of this stuff. Got it. And I see you have like super a fancy, but you know it does what it's supposed to do. Oh, you have you have discounts too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For vouchers, yeah. it's pretty cool. I saw your your um your channel, and I'm very quiet when it comes to channels. I don't say anything, but I saw yeah. your channel, and I, you know I, I definitely uh, appreciate what you do. So that's why I I wanted to to bring you on and talk today. Let me stop sharing for a second. And I, I put his information on my um on my video today, and it's below in the description. So I I suggest you guys follow him. He has a lot of good stuff in there. So go follow him if you're. The other thing is a Seven Eleven. Like I come from a restaurant background, so oh, with okay. me is like I totally I could relate to him because. I worked in in restaurant. I worked in retail. Mm -hmm. I worked in fast food. I've been in. I don't have a, a, a background in IT. Yeah. Like when I first started IT, I, I'm like pretty much brand new to IT myself. When I first started, and that's why I I, I got my my CompTIA A plus, and I did my hands on training and learn learn stuff on my own too. So that's pretty cool though. That he 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 trying to get out of Seven Eleven. He's trying to get a better yeah, job. Yeah, it's, it's, cool, it's a lot of people like that. Um, especially last year during the pandemic when jobs were being lost. A lot of you know fast food retail jobs were in jeopardy because you know if people can't come into the restaurant to eat you're not going to be able to afford your staff so people transitioning into tech from those retail hospitality type of jobs is not uncommon and in my opinion it's probably the best thing for a lot of people to consider because i always tell people even though there's no such thing as a recession proof pandemic proof job mm -hmm. it is probably about the closest thing to it because as long as we have computers and electricity there's always going to be an it job it's prime opportunity for you to get in where you fit in and you know you can go out there and potentially make a lot of money doing it if they have a lot of potential uh job security or <laughs> more job security than others doing it yeah definitely someone was asking like does tech g go live often on youtube not as often as i should not okay not on that channel <laughs> I, have, I have another channel we're not going to talk about here but yeah yeah i, I have about. another channel where i do go live quite often more than i should but on the tech g channel i don't really go live that often the main purpose of that channel is really just is the is the post the videos for the classes and i've kind of gotten somewhat behind in it due to you know life happening mm -hmm. but if it's like a, a a pertinent question like i had a couple people ask me in the, in the in the dms something matter of fact the video i did about network plus versus um ccna i may do a live about that but i'm very sporadic with it like i say the main purpose of the channel is more of a resource thing not necessarily of an entertainment spot where y'all get to come in and interact with me and I, I don't i'm not an interview type of dude i mean i can do them but i'm not an interviewer i should say i, I it's just kind of sporadic uh, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Got it. Someone else had another question. Can you tell about remote IT work tips on finding a job and the downside of remote IT jobs? Well, I don't know. I don't necessarily do remote work. I would imagine that there are a bunch of remote jobs out there due to this whole pandemic. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, avoid saying the word. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, pan the pandemic. The downside of, of remote work, I really can't think of what the downside would actually be, if, especially if you're working at home, you get to show up to work in your boxer shorts or whatever the case may be. You don't have to put miles on your car because it takes me 30 minutes to drive to my job. Man. I drive mm -hmm. a Jeep Wrangler, $50 mm -hmm. a pop, $50 a week. You know, it is what it is. So I don't know what the downside is, but tips to find it go on um indeed and just do a search for jobs and put remote as one of the search uh requirements 
prerequisites for your search, then they'll tell you everything that you need to do to possibly apply for the job. Hopefully that answers your question, but I mm-hmm. don't directly do remote work. I mean, technically I could, but I don't. So I said you should post your resume on your own website, not just a resume site. Like you should post it there. You know, that's actually, uh, that's actually true. Um, and I'm actually in the process of redoing. So, so here's the thing, guys. Here's here's what you should do, right? If you haven't done this already, go on GoDaddy or Bluehost and go buy your your government name as a domain name. So, if your name is uh, Aaron Daniels, go buy AaronDaniels.com, and then on AaronDaniels.com, put up a professional picture of yourself. Put up a professional bio of yourself and slap your resume up there. So because what happened is people are going to go Google you and you want to uh, hopefully control the narrative. If they go Google Aaron Daniels, I'm just using you as an example. Hopefully there's going to be a picture of a professional Aaron Daniels smiling with all his teeth showing and his his uh, resume up there. Mm-hmm. Giving people the warm and fuzzies that this person is a good person. Because if people Google my, my real first name, my real government name, there's a picture of me in Afghanistan talking talking about, hey, mom, live from Afghanistan, Merry Christmas. That's, that's the only picture that exists of me and my government name on the internet, right? Got Which it. is cool because, you know, I'm ex-military. But um, yes, you should do that. It helps with the networking. It helps with your brand, rec- you know, establishing your own brand because now you can create a blog around that to talk about whatever professional stuff or whatever stuff of interest you want to talk about. You know, it kind of brings you to life a little bit more than somebody else that's showing up to the interview that does that may not have that because now... Like I said, you, you go you go for an interview, you make it past the first round where your resume doesn't get rejected by the by the box that are scanning your resume. And mm-hmm. I got a video teaching you how to get past that on my channel. And now you got to go sit down face to face. Well, what separates you from the other person? All right. Well, they like my personality. Well, is, is there something else you can add? Put on your resume. Yeah, I can. More information about me can be found at AaronDaniels.com. They go to AaronDaniels.com. They see Aaron Daniels out there walking old ladies across the street, feeding random people. You know, he, he's out here just doing all type of humanitarian stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, oh man, this person's a great person. Look what he's doing. He's over here. He's over here washing seagulls. You know, they got oil on. You know, he's just doing all type of stuff. So that that, that might uh play a part into you. You can put your resume up there too. Somebody wrote from 7-Eleven to tech. Thanks to you. That's powerful. Keep it up. Appreciate that. Someone said, I already subscribed. Someone said, I'm studying the A+, and I don't get what a port is. Can you explain a port to a four-year-old? All right. A port is basically like a door that you walk through. That's it. So you got ports and you got protocols. That's what he's actually talking about. A port would be something like, uh, what is it? HTTPS port 443 or HTTP port 80. So basically what that means is you're walking through port 80, which is door number 80. And inside of door number 80, you have to abide by these rules if you want to achieve this result. And port 80 is HTTP, unsecure hypertext, uh, hypertext transfer protocol, non-secure. So basically you go up to your URL and you see where the little lock icon is, the lock icon is going to be unlocked. Basically what that means. But a port is essentially a door that your ones and zeros are going to be traveling through in order to do a certain thing on the internet. So like I said, you want to search the internet, you got two doors, port 80, port 443, and their protocols are HTTP and HTTPS. You want to send an email. So you're sitting here typing up your email. Uh, What is it? SMTP. I think that's what port 25. So now Mm -hmm. you have to go through door 25 to send your email and has to abide by these rules, aka protocols, in order to move that email from your computer to the email server, and then from that email server to the other email server where that other person is going to be hopefully receiving the email. And then if the person wants to receive the email, they have to go through two other ports, IMAP and POP3. And depending upon which door they go through, it's going to dictate how they are able to receive the email. So hopefully that makes sense. Just think of them as doors that you're pushing your ones and zeros through. And when they go through these doors, they have to abide by certain rules, the protocols. Got it. Makes sense. I agree with you with that. Um, this is like simplest way to describe it. It's basically you're going into a door and it's configured a certain way. For some people, it gets a little confusing, but you have to, you know, you just gotta. There's a certain way to teach it, you know. And er- and like I said, everyone has their own way of learning, right? We all learn our own way. Uh, let's see. Anyone else has a? Oh, so someone had a question about <laughs> default gateway difference between UTM and defense and depth. <laughs> All right, so a default gateway is essentially the IP address that your devices within your network have to find if they want to 
get out and escape to another network or the greater network, which is known as the internet. That's, that's all the default gateway is. It's is saying, go to this address right here if you want to get outside of our network to go communicate with another network. That's all the default gateway is. UTM is a unified threat management. Basically, that is like a combination of a bunch of tools such as uh, IPS, IDS, that are all combined into one device so you don't have to buy separate devices to put place on your network because it can get expensive. The defense in depth, that's basically Basically, you setting up like various perimeters of sort to protect whatever it is you're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. That's the way I can think of this. Let's just say you got a safe in your house somewhere or you got the safe locked in a room. Uh, that's one layer of security. Another layer of security is the lock on your door. Outside of that, you got security cameras, alarm systems, yada, 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 a fence with barbed wire. Basically, the further away you get from the main prize possession, the more, hopefully, layers of security you have to prevent somebody from getting closer to it. Hopefully, that makes sense. No, no, that doesn't make sense. I don't think I have any more questions for you. I asked you, I asked you a bunch of questions. We talked about your channel. I don't want to I don't want to keep you forever and bore you to death in the audience as well. I want to bore them to death. Well, hold on. My bad. AO says the default gateway is basically the router. Uh, that's true and it's not true. It's true in the sense that that's how it's always referred to. But when you start talking about subnetting and creating a, a, basically a subnetwork of, a, of a, another network, that's not always necessarily the case. So it, it's kind of hard to explain that in this. But yeah. it's true and it's not true. Just, just understand that. And someone someone said network. You need networking for sysadmin. How important is networking for sys? That's very important. It's very very important, especially when we talk about DNS and DHCP and scopes and reservations and least time and how to reserve IP addresses is very important. Very, very important that you know about networking. If you don't know about networking and you're a sysadmin, you're in trouble. Uh, the difference between SSCM and Casper. And SSCM is on, SSCM is basically, uh, um, this is a steroid, you know, you could, you could image computers, you deploy software. There's like so many things you could do on SSCM and you could remote into someone's computer. Casper, are you familiar with Casper? I have never used Casper. I don't even know what that is. I was looking it up. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, I, I, have, I have. I'm not. I never used Casper before, but SSCM. I know what SSCM is. You guys have any more questions before I let uh, Teji Teji go? Because I know Teji has to. I know Teji is like you're not feeling 100 percent well. You know, it's just. Oh no, no, I'm good, man. Um, like I say, I had a little cold last week. I'm not you know, down for the count. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so someone said, "Is it okay to go for security plus before A plus?" Yeah. Oftentimes, there is no necessary requirement that you have to get A plus unless it explicitly states on your job description that you have to have it. If you go get your security plus, that trumps the A plus and network plus. It's a, it's, it's a higher rank certification. If you want to go get a government job or become a contractor that does government work, you definitely have to have a security plus. And if you don't have your A plus, they may overlook you. Like, all right, well, so what? But you get your security plus. You're qualified to go for the job. So it's not bad. I, like I say, I just tell people at the end of the day, getting the A plus can't hurt you. And especially if you pass on the first try, you don't have to do a retest, but it can't hurt you to learn about the core element of information technology, which mm -hmm. are computers. No matter how big, no matter how small, it doesn't hurt you to learn about it. Whether or not you want to get it or not is another thing. And someone was asking about the difference between Ghost and Clonezilla. I use Norton Ghost for imaging PCs. I haven't used Clonezilla. Are you use Clonezilla? Nah, I haven't done any of that stuff in years. Any, any type of cloning, like that's that's not even. We're talking like over a decade since I've actually done roles that actually require me to use stuff like that. So I'm not even front. I'm not even familiar with what Clonezilla is. I mean, I kind of have an idea what it sounds like, but I haven't, I haven't used it. Someone says like the teamwork aspect of my my assisting manager retail job. What IT job beyond help this is good for me, like sysadmin or something else. I was asking. Let's see here. How important is Windows Server knowledge for technical support? You know about Active Directory. So yeah, it's been a long time I use Active Directory. We're talking over ten years, but <laughs> um, I know about it. It's still out there. It's important. This is what your hierarchical is basically just a hierarchical database you use to keep track and tabs of what all devices and people that are on the network. What all are they allowed to do on the network? You know, you know, through your whole GPOs and all that stuff. All right, guys, I'm gonna let you guys go. I am going to close it out for today i hope everyone's having a good day and tech g is there any like final words you want to say to everyone before we let we let you go yeah so tech g technology g is my website tech g is my channel like i say i teach entry level it how to get started that's, that's my primary focus i try to answer everything i can i'm not a subject matter expert in all areas of it it's impossible for everybody to be that but i teach people how to get started what is what is a computer what are computers how they talk how to secure them and other other stuff like that but if you're looking to get started in tech and you don't know what you want to do my channel's a resource there are a thousand other resources on youtube google 
you know, just kind of go through and kind of figure some things out. Don't be scared. You don't have to be a math expert or have these super high advanced level degrees to get started in tech. You can start off in tech doing some basic entry level stuff within about five years, realistically be on the path to making over six figures. And I've seen it done countless times. So tech is the future. It ain't going nowhere. So if you're out there trying to figure out how to get your life on and popping, you want to, uh, you know, pretty stable career field. I encourage you to look at tech, see if that is something that you can implement into your life. Awesome, man. All right. I hope everyone has a good day. I hope everyone has a good weekend and a good evening. And I'm going to close out the stream, but I'm going to keep you here for a second. (laughs) So uh, I'll talk to everyone. I hope everyone has a good one. All right. Take care. Peace.